Jitu, thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let's remind ourselves that this house believes that it is necessary to re-narrate our history. And in order to do so, to propose the motion, it's the pleasure of the house to invite Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal to propose the motion for the proposition. Friends and fellow Zavarians, it's with great pleasure that I have come here to speak to you today on a field where the last time I attended an event, it was the sports day in 1987. But it's a special pleasure because it is to talk about a subject that I have written about, talked about for many, many years. And this is this, that our history needs to be re-narrated because it is not our history at all. It is in fact the history of our invaders. It's the history that our colonial masters wanted to tell us. Have you noticed that whenever in your textbooks there is a battle, the Indians always lose three battles of Plassey in, sorry, three battles of Panipat, Indians lose. Battle of Plassey, Indians lose. Battle of Baksar, Indians lose. Now surely in our very long 5,000 year old history, we must have won some battles. After all, we are still here. So what happened to those battles? The problem was that much of the history that we still read in our textbooks or even in our general conversation is really history that was left behind by us, by our colonial masters. But sadly, 75 years after independence, we have still not corrected this. So let me tell you a little bit about a few of the characters of Indian history and I'll illustrate to you how this works. How many of you have heard of Raja Prithu of Assam? There's literally one person in the entire audience who's heard of him. But I'm sure almost all of you have heard of Bhaktiar Khilji. Bhaktiar Khilji, who sacked Nalanda and conquered Bengal. But how did Bhaktiar Khilji die? Now it turns out that after conquering Bengal, he invaded Tibet. And on his way back, he was about to cross one of the tributaries of the Brahmaputra when he was met by an Assamese army led by Raja Prithu, who defeated him so badly and completely destroyed his army. And Bhaktiar Khilji just about managed to escape back to Bengal. But his army had been so badly decimated that Bhaktiar Khilji was actually killed by his own generals. So that is how Bhaktiar Khilji died. And yet, Almost none of you have heard of Raja Prithu. Now, similarly, let me ask how many of you have heard of Martanda Verma of Travancore? Okay, at least there are five or six people in an audience of a few thousand. Now, Martanda Verma was an important character not just in Indian history, but in world history. Back in the early 18th century, the Dutch were the most powerful maritime power in the world. They had conquered South Africa, they had conquered what is now Indonesia, they had conquered Sri Lanka, and they were attempting to conquer India as well. When they faced up with this small kingdom called Travancore and its king, Martanda Verma. And Martanda Verma in the Battle of Kolachal defeated the Dutch so badly that not only did he win that battle, but the Dutch East India Company went into decline and that is how the British East India Company and the French East India Company came to dominate the Indian Ocean. But for Martanda Varma, I would have been giving the speech to you in Dutch. So he was not just an important character in Indian history. He was a world important character. And after Martanda Varma, the next Asiatic power that happened to defeat uh, a European power was in 1905 when the Japanese beat the Russians. 
Now, everybody knows about the Japanese beating the Russians in 1905, but everybody has forgotten about Martha Navarma. But this systematic history telling in a particular tilt is done in such a smooth way that you get the impression that the foreigners had always ruled this country. So, for example, you get the impression that the Mughals ruled India and that the British ruled India. The fact is that for intervening 70 years, the Marathas ruled India. In fact, they ruled more of India than Akbar the Great. And yet, they too have been forgotten. Because it would be, have been very, very inconvenient to have a fact that an indigenous ruler was ruling over India in between these two foreign powers. So the problem really is this repeated telling of story in a colonial way. And this is now 75 years after independence. So why didn't we change this narrative? The reason we didn't change the narrative is that after independence, the historians that came about were far more interested in retelling the story of the independence movement in a peculiar sort of way. You get the impression from reading again our textbooks that the Indian freedom movement was a peculiarly peaceful one. That we basically gently suggested to the British they should leave, and they politely left. But the fact is that there was a armed resistance against the British as well. And by the way, the history of this city is very closely linked to that revolutionary history. And yet the revolutionary history is almost but wiped out of our consciousness. Yes, some of you may be aware of some of the great characters of that, like Raj Bihari Bose, Netaji, of <coughs> Bhagat Singh and Chandrasekhar Azad. But you get the impression that these were all random acts of individual bravery. Far from it, this was a movement that lasted a full half century. Most of these characters knew each other. It was a well-organized movement that in the First World War attempted to create an Indian National Army. It had international ne networks, even had an embassy in Berlin in the First World War. So it was the setting up of the INA in Singapore was not something that just happened out of thin air. Now I've run out of time, but I hope I have been able to convince you that in fact, the story of this country really does need to be re-narrated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Shunjeev. And I think, I don't know whose clever idea it was, but I think as a mark of gratitude for burning Nalanda for a few months, uh, I think that place was called Bhaktiarpur, wasn't it? It's still called Bhaktiarpur. I think it's still called Bhaktiarpur. So such are the funny twists and turns of Indian history. But there was something very common to all our textbooks that whatever history we wrote, we, we read, we almost inevitably forgot them within the next week. You know? <laughs> so I think you know, we very much, apart from those who had an interest in history reading people like you, etc., we very much started with a clean slate in the adult life. You know? Most of the school textbooks were well forgotten about a week after the exam. Now, we have none other than Mani Shankar Iyer to come up and oppose the opening that Sanjeev has just done. Mr. Iyer. Just one second, just microphone. Yeah. I hope these minutes are not being recorded. No, they're not. They're not. <laughs> Thank you. I assure you, they're not. They're not. Is somebody coming? Okay, what? You're fine, sir. You're fine. Yes. Oh, all right. Um, I'm. I am audible. I, I trust. Mr. Chairman, sir. I was really looking forward to Mr. Sanyal's intervention and had been told that it would be coming later in the proceedings. But I do wish to begin by acknowledging that he is a reputed historian and that Professor Anand Raghunathan 
who was originally scheduled to initiate this debate, is none less than a professor of history at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, although perhaps he would prefer to have it called the Veer Savarkar University. These two historians certainly make me feel very uncomfortable about having to oppose them because I have no such credentials. But the idea that not, that the history we were taught is not our history at all, but one of colonial masters was certainly not true at my school. I don't wish to denigrate St. Xavier's, but I'd be astonished if St. Xavier's had only a colonial view of Indian history to teach its children, because otherwise our children would not be so distinguished as to become economic advisor to the Prime Minister of India. There is therefore quite clearly an ulterior motive which sits with the two historians on that platform. And that <laughs> ulterior motive is that they wish to provide an interpretation of India that is simply not in consonance with the facts. And to try and establish that point, I have brought with me an extract from a historian who is being very celebrated in certain circles, one Vikram Sampat, who has just written a massive biography of Veer Savarkar that has quite overtaken the earlier Dhananjay Kheer version. And it is from pages 196 to 199 of Vikram Sampat's biography of Savarkar that I take the following gems of uh, history to account for why Professor Anand Ranganathan should be so disgracing himself as to be on that side instead of ours. Here it goes. This is Veer Savarkar, not as quoted by some subversive ayer who removed his name from the flame of freedom in the Andaman Islands, but from Vikram Sampat's book. He says, there are two antagonistic nations living side by side in India. I thought Jinnah said that, but that was in 1940. This was said in the early 20s, that there are two antagonistic nations living side by side in India. These are two nations in the main, Hindus and Muslims. The solid fact, he goes on, is that the so-called communal questions are but a legacy handed to us by centuries of cultural, religious, and national antagonisms between the Hindus and Muslims. Now, if it is to validate views like this, that history is being changed or re-narrated, that is neither historical nor even, nor even anti-history. It is historical ignorance. We were told by Mr. Sanyal that Indians always lost. Well, might I quote from, or say, cite at any rate, a gentleman who certainly had his education at Harvard and at Harrow and uh, Cambridge, but was one of India's leading freedom fighters. I refer, of course, to Jawaharlal Nehru, and I beg Mr. Sanyal's pardon to take the name of a hero of mine who is being portrayed as a devil by him and his colleagues. This man points out that, that after Mahmud of Ghazni had sacked, had sacked the uh, temple at Somnath, I'm quoting now, he met severe defeat in the Rajputana desert region on his way back from Somnath and in consequence 
This was Ghazni's last raid, and he did not return. Now, didn't they teach this in St. Xavier's? And if they didn't, well, they should. That's all I can say. The story of India is not a story of Hindu defeats. There are lots of incidents where, historically speaking, there is no doubt that resident Indians were defeated. But there are many more stories of resident Indians defeating other resident Indians long before the Muslims came to India. Ramila Thapa has shown in her book on Somnath that Somnath, because it, was, it had such a huge treasury, was an object of loot, rapine, by several Hindu, readly, Hindu kings before Mahmud of Ghazni ever heard that there was a place called Somnath. And because of these raids, that is why he included Somnath in his agenda. Now, shouldn't we be recounting these two, these internecine fights? He says, none of us know that for 70 years after the Mughals, India was ruled by the Marathas, by the Hindus. I don't know which examination Mr. Sanyal has appeared for, although clearly he has appeared for his exams with far greater distinction than I have. But in my IAS paper, I was posed the question, India was taken by the British from the Hindus and not the Muslims, discuss. We actually had that as an IAS question. And I answered as best as I could. But my answer doesn't matter. The fact is that the Marathas having ruled was well known to Indians long before Mr. Sanyal came to teach them that. We've got to wind up. Yes, certainly. And uh, he was referring to the Azad Hind Forge of Subhash Chandra Bose. He called it the Azad Hind Forge, not the Mukt Bharat Sena. And why? Who were its brigades? Its brigades were not named after Savarkar, Golbalkar, Hedgevar, or even Narendra Modi. They were named as the Mahatma Gandhi Brigade, the Jawaharlal Nehru Brigade, and the Maulana Azad Brigade. Now, in the yep. light of this, why is it that they want to re-narrate history? They want to go away from all the facts. They want to go away from the fact that Mahmud of Ghazni, uh, sorry, uh, Muhammad bin Qasim was put to death by the Khalif in Damascus within months of returning from India. Mr. They want to take revenge on him. Mr. Ayer, you'll come back again. So we... All right, I'll come back and give you some more history. In the meanwhile, I request you to take with a large dollop of salt everything you're going to hear from that side. And if you want to pass your history exams, please listen to what our side has to say. Thank you. <laughs> and there is, there is definitely a, a sort of escalating conflict of history syllabus between the two sides. And uh, I think, you know, as the evening rolls on, the, the question papers are going to get tougher and tougher. And taking on the accusation of exaggeration, an accusation of bias that Mr. Iyer has really uh, thrust upon the proposition, we have Mr. Desh Ratan Nigam. Mr. Nigam. really to be a pleasure in this August house. And believe me, while I was, I was walking in the evening, the esteemed corridors of this college, I met history. And she painfully told me, I don't want to repeat myself. And she further told me, please record me correctly. And it reminded me of R.C. Majumdar. 
the great man who immediately after the independence wanted to write the true and correct history of india in fact he was made the director of the board of editors and in 1952 that board was created however dismantled because it did not want to write false histories of the so called leaders at that point of time <laughs> that board was dismantled in 1955 by the bootlickers of the kind of bureaucrats like tarachan and let me also remind you that is marginalize marginalization and banishment led to the lies and distortions in history he was finally able to write two volumes two two sets of volumes about the history of india and let me quote what rc majumdar said the history of india is not the story of how she underwent foreign invasions but how she resisted them and eventually triumphed over them to be a history in the true sense the work must be the story of inhabiting a country it must be a record of their life from age to age presented through the life and achievement of men whose ex ex exploits become the beacon of lights of tradition the central purpose of a history must be to investigate and unfold the values which age after age have inspired the inhabitants of the country to develop their collective will of a country such a history of india is still to be written and he tried his best now since before you narrate a history it has to be recorded correctly and truthfully and whether it is battle of diwar between uh, maharana pratap and akbar which has been wiped out from history or people like shaksena from uh, the lady commander from the jammu and kashmir i could give you immense amount of example of the brutal and savage history of turkic invaders in india i can go on and on but the whole problem since i am a lawyer let me come down to some of the concepts that while studying law in delhi university we were told the concept of rule of law was given by some, by some fellow called dicey and all pun intended and let me tell you and let me point out the what the history of india and says about about uh, some of these uh, you know dharma and it is given in uh, while yudhishthir uh, asks a question and bhishma replies in shanti parv of mahabharat dharma the law sustains a society dharma maintains the social order and brihadar ka upanishad states dharma the law is the king of kings no one is superior to law which is dharma the law aided by the power of the kings enables a weak to prevail over the strong what is this this is rule of law thousands and thousands of years of back and the rule of equality and we were told dicey gave us this concept of law now let me also point out the supreme court in its book which has not been which has now been forgotten by the judges himself it states all unique principles well thought out procedures and best practices some of which surpass the best modern legal system made the hindu court system sustain and serve for a couple of millennia the concept of duties and responsibilities were told were taken from ireland but it is clearly given on a rig rigveda and the smritis where they say and vishnu puran especially says bharat is a land of duties and responsibilities shrimad bhagavad gita states that the right vested in the mankind is to perform his duty dharma this flexible dynamic and self explanatory concept of dharma was the sustenance which is known as dri of the bharatiya society since time immemorial now let me come on to spirituality the entire history of jurisprudence in india starting from rigved down till the times the turkic invasion took place was based on spirituality to look inside and inward spirituality is truthfulness and honesty and integrity is the by product the day our constitution 
although I have great regards and we live under the constitution, the way it left sp spirituality and started looking towards the concepts which were not inward seeking, we left the path which led to corruption, nepotism, and huge amount of you know ills that is plaguing our society. Mr. Now, Mr. Nigam, can we just have the microphone a bit closer to you, please? Yes. And therefore, even Guru Nanak said, truth is high, truthful living is higher, and honesty and integrity is the byproduct. He was talking about the spirituality. Our courts have stopped at morality and ethics. Morality and ethics varies from person to person and society to society. It is the spirituality that remains the same because it is inward looking. And you have to go back to the spirituality, whether it is the court's judgment or not. The role of the courts are very, very important. I'll give you an example of Ram Mandir, where the High Court at Prayagraj gave a wonderful judgment. And in the end, politicized it by giving a three-way distribution. Certainly a title, when they clearly found the title was in favor of the Ram Lala. Now the Supreme Court, let me tell you, gave a verdict in favor of Ram Mandir. But despite overwhelming evidence, it called the structure underground as non-Islamic. And the director at that point of time, Dr. K.K. Mohammed, was shocked and, 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 and actually surprised as to how is that possible because the overwhelming evidence was in favor of a Ram Mandir, which is a Hindu temple. So unless and until we have a history told in schools, we are not going to learn from it. We are going to repeat it. And the history of riots, the history of comparative religion, the history of famines have to be taught in our college to actually understand. And you all remember Bengal famine. And one important question, which the uh, historians like Romila Thapar and Bipin Chandra raise, is how far do we go back in history? I tell them, dude, this is the job of a historian. Irony died million deaths when they are scared of going into the past and investigating and unearthing it. And therefore, we have to correctly record it, investigate, whether good, bad, or ugly. Mughals can be a part of history, but not your heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nigam. Thank you. I think it was a couple of years back that even the British historians acknowledged Churchill's role in the Bengal famine. It is now on to Mr. Johor Shorkar, Johorda. Oh, it is, it is Manish. I'm sorry, beg your pardon. Mr. Manish Tiwari, you have a lot of questions raised by Mr. Nigam, and I'm sure you'll take them on one by one. Mr. Manish Tiwari. Mr. Chairperson, uh, it's always a pleasure to be back in the great city of Calcutta, now called Kolkata. And may I commence where you left off with uh, Winston Churchill. And Churchill had very famously and prophetically said that if we open a quarrel between the past and the present, we shall find that we have lost the future. And so therefore, this attempt to, or this urgent need to reiterate our history is actually opening a quarrel between the present and the past. History, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing but a chart sheet. And as a lawyer, I can tell you, a chart sheet is nothing more than events and circumstances as best understood by the investigating officer. I fail to understand what re-narrating our history would achieve. Would re-narrating our history change the fact that the word Hindu finds first mention in the Zoroastrian text, Zen Devastha, compiled during the 4th to the 6th century AD or Common Era to denote the people who lived beside the river Sindhu? Would re-narrating history change the fact that Indian history <clears throat> from 1000 to 1707 was not a Hindu-Muslim binary, 
as some of our esteemed colleagues would want us to believe, but really a contest between feudals. Would re-narrating history change the fact <coughs> that Muhammad Ghori was invited to invade India by Jaichan that led to the death, the capture and death of Prithvira Chavan in the Battle of Terrain in 1192? Would re-narrating history, ladies and gentlemen, change the fact that in the Battle of Haldi Ghati in 1576, Maharana Pratap's general commanding his artillery <coughs> was a gentleman called Hakim Khan Sur, while the Mughal uh, 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 forces were led by Raja Man Singh? Would re-narrating <coughs> history change the fact that in 1761, <coughs> in the third battle of Panipat, the Maratha artillery was commanded by a general called Ibrahim Khan Gardi, who was put to death in the most brutal manner by Ahmed Shah Abdali post the third battle of Panipat. Would re-narrating history <coughs> change the fact that in 1608 and 1615, thank you, the British came as traders and by 1857 they were masters of India thanks to the Indian feudals. Would re-narrating history <coughs> change the fact that while Sir Sayyid Ahmed on the 14th of March 1888 conceptualized the two-nation theory, it was quickly endorsed by the Hindu Mahasabha leader <coughs> Bhai Parmanand <coughs> between 1908 and 1909 by Lala Lajpat Rai on the 14th of December, 1924, writing in the Tribune by Muhammad Iqbal <coughs> during his presidential address to the Muslim League on the 29th of Dece <coughs> December, 1930 by Mr. Sarbarkar of the Hindu Mahasabha in Ahmedabad in 1937 by Chaudhary Rehmat Ali between 1933 and 37 by Muhammad Ali Jinnah in 1940 and finally, in 1943, re-endorsed by Mr. Sarbarkar. So would re-narrating Indian history actually change all these facts? Would re-narrating history <coughs> in any way take away from the criminal culpability of Winston Churchill for the Bengal famine? And if I was to widen the ambit of this debate, would re-narrating history in case the Nazis had won in 1945 change the fact that six million Jews were put to death during the Holocaust between 1937 and 1945? Would re-narrating history, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> change the fact that in a span of 100 days, eight lakh Tutsis were slaughtered by the Hutus. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, this endeavor of trying to reopen a quarrel with the past is a path which is laden with peril. And therefore, in my humble estimation, just because there is a certain dispensation today which has a certain view of history. It does not give them the license and it does not give them the leave to either re-narrate history as to how they see it or for that matter, try and obfuscate history in order to give a certain narrative which suits their political predilections of the day. That, ladies and gentlemen, would be the most fallacious endeavor to embark upon. And therefore, uh, Mr. Chairperson, you will not have to ring the bell again. I will end one minute before my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tiwari. Very crisp. He's asked a series of questions. I think there were about 14 questions in his submission in front of the House. And at the end of it, he makes an absolutely firm remark that whether we dissect the corpus of Indian history 
with an attitude to opening up past wounds. If that is all this exercise is going to deliver and to answer that dilemma, we have Lalitha Kumara Mangalam. Ma'am. Good evening, Kolkata. I'm very happy to be here, back in a city where I spent every summer of my childhood in my mama's house. Today, I'm not here as a politician. I'm not going to make personal attacks on anybody from the other side or on my side of the table. I'm just here as an Indian woman, as a half Bengali and a half South Indian. To me, why should Indian history be rewritten? The big emphatic yes, of course, I'm sure you've already heard because of the reasons I'm going to give and the questions I'm going to ask. I come from the South. I grew up in Chennai, partly Delhi, but mostly Chennai. The history that I was taught, both in my convent school in Chennai and a very left liberal school in Delhi, did not include enough history on Indian women. India's history has always revered women, regardless of religion, regardless of politics, regardless of everything else. Today I stand in a city and in a state. I had a Bengali mother, so I know how tough Bengali women are. And I love them. I've inherited a large part of that toughness, which has stood me in very, very good stead throughout my life. I may have been born into a very big influential family, but I've seen a lot of ups and downs in my life. And what has stood me in good stead is the belief that I was taught by a very tough communist aunt who was a three-time MP Parvati Krishnan, by a very left liberal father who was very close to Indira Gandhi. I'm from a very left liberal family. Let me just leave it at that. But the fact is that Indian history, as we know it today, has not done justice to our women. How many of us know that there were 15 women in the Constituent Assembly of India? Okay, about three hands I'm seeing. Do we know five names from those 15? None. Isn't that a shame? We were only 15 out of nearly 300, but the 15 were there. Why are they forgotten? How many of us know of the history of the South? The great Chera, Shola, Pandya kingdoms, to state a few. How many of us know that democracy exists, existed in India more than 3,000 years ago? Uttira Merur is a village in Kanchipuram district. We know Kanchipuram only for the silk saris that we all wear. Why don't we know that India is almost the fountainhead of democracy? I don't care what people's reasons are. To paraphrase one of my favorite heroes, I don't give a damn what the reasons are. I love Red Butler, that's an aside. But the fact remains that in every field in our histori uh, historical, however way history is presented to us, we don't even know the names of the big queens of India. Durgavati, the tribal queen who married outside, who had the guts to write a letter to a man some 10 centuries ago, that I want to marry you, and married him. And then ran his uh, kingdom very successfully for about 20 years after he died. How many of us know the names of the two chief ministers, women chief ministers, who came before Indira Gandhi did? I will tell you the names now. Sucheta Kripalani and Nandini Satpati. They were both Congress uh, um, chief ministers. Like I said, this is not about politics for me. For me, it's much more personal. I have two daughters. I have a granddaughter. And to every sister, colleague sitting here in the audience, man or woman, women are 50%, a little over 50% now of the population in India. Don't you think we deserve our justice or our rights, at least for the famous women to be mentioned in our history? That's all I ask. Quite frankly, I don't care if you're a communist, you're from the Congress, you're from the BJP, you're from SP, blah, blah, blah. I don't care what elections we win, lose, etc. For me, history must be at least partially rewritten because our women have just not been given the place that they rightfully have. Indian history refers uh, shakti. This is Bengal, for God's sake. Durga is everywhere. 
She's everything. But how many people remember Sarojini Naidu as the original Nightingale of India? I love Lata Mangeshkar. Let me say that. She's just passed away. With all due respect to her beautiful music and her singing, how many people remember Sarojini Naidu? And why don't we remember her if we don't? How many famous queens, whether from the south or the north, Razia Sultan, how many of us know about her? She's the only one who gets a little mention in the history books. We read of Rani Lakshmi Mai and Indira Gandhi. The rest is a big blank for thousands of years, 5,000 years. How many of us remember Sita as a woman who finally said, done is done, enough is enough. I'm going back to my Maike. You do what you want, Ram. We look on her as a loser. But women are not losers, especially not Indian women. I don't care what they are in the West, how they are portrayed and all of that. I'm an Indian. I'm bothered about Indian history. And to me, Indian history, as we read it today, as we are taught it today, just does not do justice to our women. There's a woman called Kannagi. This is from Tamil. Anybody from Tamil Nadu will know this. In an epic, she stood up to the, one of the most powerful Pandya kings because he had uh, murdered her husband according to her. Her husband was wrongfully accused of uh, stealing the anklet of the queen. The epic show goes that eventually her curse burnt the city of Madurai down. But we don't know that story. Powerful women who were not queens, powerful women who contributed to the history of India, they're just not there in our history books. And like I said, it doesn't matter to me why they were not there. That must change. We had saints, Andal. We had philosophers, Maitreyi and Gargi. We had women in every sphere of society who led from both home and outside their homes, much like women today. Today's India is a res has a huge resurgent youth. You know, we follow by example. We read of Indira Gandhi, we read of the few women that we are taught about, and we say, why can't we be them? We're taught that if there is a will, there is a way. But we must have idols whom we can look up to. Anybody who is young will tell you that. And this is what I find objectionable in the history that I have read so far, and which all of us have. This, again, like I said, has nothing to do with religion, with politics, and all the rest of it. I put this question before you, my friends. Do you agree with me or not? Thank you very much. Madam, be careful. Thank you very much for opening an entirely new dimension to the debate. And uh, ma'am, I can assure you that in the Bengal of the present, we have no problems in recognizing powerful women. <laughs> and I know of someone who probably acknowledge and certified this fact because that person is the next speaker, Mr. Johor Sharkar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's so nice, so wonderful to see four highly intelligent persons on the other side, on the wrong side, uh, because these four enlightened persons represent a substantial percentage of this type in a party that believes in smashing, lynching, and destroying churches. Uh, it's a substantial number, percentage. Now, I stand here today to reiterate that we do not need to re-narrate, re-narrate our history. Sanjeev started by saying it's not our history, it is British history. Fair enough. If you think so, you had eight years to change it. You had eight years to change it. You don't have facts at your disposal. Otherwise, you have changed the face of India from a liberal, plural, democratic society that uh, Lalita described as the fountainhead of democracy to the graveyard of democracy. You had eight years to destroy everything. You could have destroyed that history. So let's face facts. Let's get mature. History is a collective effort of recording facts. You can go on adding to them. You can even go on subtracting to them. But using words like re-narrate is subterfuge. It is akin 
to the 15 lakh rupees that I shall put in every bank account promise. It's akin to that. It's subterfuge and downright lies on which, distortions on which a particular regime survives. This history that we already have, the one that we acknowledge, the one that we have at our disposal, and the one that can be subjected to new effects. Do you know what Hindu history means before scientific history came up? Alexander's invasion was between 327 and 3, uh, 327 and 325 BC, approximately. Forget the dates, nobody remembers dates. But we know Alexander invaded India, and the whole world knows that Alexander invaded India. There is no mention of it in our textbooks, in our history at all, until history syllabus was rewritten on the basis of evidence from Strabo, Aryan, and other Greek historians. There was a conspiracy of silence. This is a history where omission is a greater danger than commission. I have given Alexander's example. Alexander's example was not mentioned in the two itihas, the names that give for Purans, the Matsa Puran and the Vishnu Puran that were written exactly in Punjab during that period, not a whisper. So here is a conspiracy of silence, the one of deletion. I'll mention another. Do you know that all of ancient India swells with pride at the greatest samrat that we had, Ashoka? Ashoka was deleted, aborted from Indian history at all. There was no memory of Ashoka until James Princip, a young man of 35 years, discovered, rediscovered Ashoka at the other end of Park Street, Asiatic Society. Thank you very much. That is the history we have been, we have been brought up until a lot of cleansing took place. Of course, the British used their distortions. They use distortions, they use their ideology. Every victor does. But can we deny that we lost at the Battle of Plassey? Can we say we won at the Battle of Plassey? Can we go back and say that, uh, that Rana Pratap won Haldighati? He was an extremely brave fighter. He fought even after Haldighati, but where Haldighati is concerned, he lost it. So let's face facts, let's get mature. We talk of those forces that come up to convert. Whole of Southeast Asia became either Buddhist or Hindu. You know that. I know that. We see the statues, we see the sculpture. Did they come in shiploads to India and say, convert me to Hinduism? Obviously, there was a proselytizing force that went from India. Let us use our thinking caps because we go by the sins of omission. Of course, there have been people who have gone from India to preach. If that is not proselytization, I don't know what it is. But why do you go and breaking churches today? Because somebody believes in proselytization. Get mature. The destruction of Buddhist monuments is an evidence of what tolerance Hindu history has shown. All these monuments of Buddhism, all the grand edifices, had to be rediscovered between 1835 and 1880. They had to be rediscovered. The archaeologists paid unearthed what Brahmanical history had made us forget. What history are you talking about? Are you willing to discuss that? When you talk of binaries, the us and them, Mr. Tiwari has already said, do you know that the Marathas that you talk about, who were the generals who led the Marathas? Siddhi Hilal, Siddhi Yawa, Siddhi Ibrahim, Darya Sarang, Kazi Haider, Dolat Khan, Ibrahim Khan. Are they Hindu leaders? What distortion are you bringing out? Who led the battle for the Mughals and defeated a Hindu at Haldighati? It was a Rajput Hindu. So why are you bringing this Hindu-Muslim divide with retrospective effect? Why are you trying to break, shatter the harmony in which we have lived? You have no right. Just because you have been given a temporary lease, and that lease happens to be has just been renewed, much to our concern, a lease renewed in a part of India. The Hindi, Hindu, Hindutva belt, the result, just because you are in temporary, you are the chokidar of India, does not make you the owner of India. Did you see the flies that were flying around? It was a temporary phenomenon. All regimes have gone, and you shall go also. 
but do not destroy the India to, into which I was born, into which you were born. Do not destroy the factual basis. You talked of woman, Deshraj Nigam, Ladita spoke about woman. You spoke about Manuspriti. Manuspriti that treats woman like cattle. Manuspriti, another text that tells women to go up to the funeral pyre and die alive. Would you like to bring that again? What sort of history are you talking about? What sort of ideology are you talking about? They believe in treating other castes as chattel. They believe in multiple marriages. Would you like to bring backwardness in the name of Sapka Saat, Sapka Vikas? With these words, I oppose the motion. Thank you. Johorda, well spoken. Well spoken. I think that was a very strong rebuttal. And you started off with Alexander. I think the time was first century AD when Alexander wanted to cross over to the east. And I believe Alexander was discouraged by the presence of a fierce tribe in the Gangetic Delta and in those days known by the name of Gonga Ridhi, what is today's Chandra Ketugor. So I think you know, there is such a lot of history. And look at the interpretations we've had. Every seven minutes, you and I feel that as if we have been entirely convinced, and in the next seven minutes, that conviction stands entirely shattered. And for the last speaker, who's going to take us through this roller coaster ride of conviction this evening, is Anand, Anand Ranganathan, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairperson and Madam Chairperson. You know, I came prepared for my seven minutes, but I request for the clock to not be started just yet. Uh, because I need to rebut uh, the excellent Mr. Mani Shankar Iyer for his plethora of lies, particularly against me, but I don't want it to eat into my time. So it's a humble request. Moreover, it would uh, only take me 30 seconds. Uh, now, normally I would ignore money like the first and last slices of a loaf of bread. But today I want to make a sandwich out of him. <laughs> Thank you. Money, I'm convinced, was born to make Rahul Gandhi look good. Uh, to be sure, he raised some very valid points. Sadly, the spelling is R-A-Z-E-D. -E he has destroyed all arguments. Let me expose just two lies. Number one, it wasn't Savarkar the first to propound the two-nation theory, but rather Sir Sayed, 40 years before Savarkar. And the quote that Hindus and Muslims are two antagonistic races is in fact Sir Sayed's, not Savarkar's. In fact, the first one to propound the two-nation theory was not even Sir Sayed, but Mani's ideological god, Karl Marx, in his 1853 book, The Eastern Question. So much for reading history, Mani. Number two, and this is a very easy lie to rebut because I am sorry, Mani, I am not a professor of history in JNU, but a professor of molecular medicine. And I am right now involved in making a, a vaccine that would allow people to be immune against lies. So if you want, you can be the first volunteer. Um, can I now please request the chair to start the clock? Thank you. Uh, for inviting me to this wonderful debate with a wonderful audience and wonderful adversaries who, and I say this in a lighter vein, can be introduced in four sentences. The first was kept in suspended animation by the Congress. The second has been suspended by the Congress. The third is itching to be suspended by the Congress. And the fourth is so sloshed that he can't even remember if he is he or he is not suspended by the Congress. As for the topic, I'm intrigued because this much emphasis on history, quite frankly, amuses me. Forget re-narrating. What in the first place do we mean by our history? You see, as a scientist, the time scale that interests me is not 100 or 500 or 1,000 years, but 1 billion or 5 billion or 10 billion years. And on this time scale, I'm not Indian, but Ethiopian. I am not a descendant of a Ranganathan, 
but the descendant of AL2881 or Lucy. And I am not a creation of design, but of a conspiracy hatched by thunder and lightning and water and ammonia and hydrogen and methane and dust. Let religion and its mesmerizing literature not fool you into believing you were created by someone who wasn't a product of the RNA world. And so nothing really matters whether our ancestors were brilliant or not, whether our culture is ancient or not, whether our religions are better or not. We are but an inconsequential bunch of cells. Then why does history matter? It matters because like science, it has to be built on an edifice of truthful observation and facts because the correct understanding of it strengthens us, helps us survive with a slight difference. Scientists like black and white, historians love the gray. This gray has given mankind, I put to you ladies and gentlemen, only misery. It is because of the gray that there are people who still believe in religious books or in Mao and Hitler and Tipu and Goetze and Churchill and Rhodes and Aurangzeb and hundreds more who have committed awful crimes but the believers of gray have forgiven them because they also did some good. Gray is social Darwinism gone berserk. Gray has birthed cruel empires and believers of the gray have fettered them. Worse, our history has been written by those who believe in the gray. Nations weaken not because of their past, but rather by how they are taught it. For 70 years, we have been taught to forget historical injustices, from Somnath to Kashi Vishwanath, Babarpur to Bhaktiarpur, from Allahabad to Aurangabad. These injustices have deliberately been made visible as though to lionize the debasement, celebrate the humiliation. And the irony is that the same people who have taught us this drill this self-loathing in us. These very same people, men and women of grey, want others to fight historical injustice around the world. They condemn barbarians of the West, hitherto worshipped, like the Confederacy generals, Rhodes, Churchill, Pizarro, Murray, Colston, Leopold. They celebrate their roads and buildings being renamed, their statues being brought down. But here in India, they eulogize Tipu, Aurangzeb, Babar, Khilji. They celebrate the destruction of Kashi, Mathura, Ayodhya, Martand. Why? To me, the mark of civilization is this unquenchable thirst to demand justice for your ancestors, to correct a historical wrong, for that exemplifies a continuity, an idea, a memory that can never be erased, that is worth fighting for and preserving. It makes justice greater than the sum of its parts. And that is why civilizations are not fleeting like empires. That is why history is a medicine. Catharsis is a cure. If an image could speak a million words, it would be that of the Gyan Vyapi mosque built atop Kashi Vishwanath demolished by Aurangzeb. If orphaned stones could speak and not just weep, the stories they would tell of Mathura idols being used as stepping stones in a mosque, why shouldn't Mathura or Kashi be washed of the sins of the tyrants committed on it? But the Supreme Court has willfully ratified the Places of Worship Act that obligates maintaining all religious places as they were on August 15, 1947. In a just world, our parliament and our Supreme Court wouldn't have done this, but they have. Why? Because we are fearful of learning our true history. There are hundreds of examples, but just one would suffice. Tipu Sultan. Read his manifesto, written in his own words. It is a terrifying proclamation calling for all Muslims to come together to wage jihad. Annihilation of the infidels is a sacred duty, he writes. The Hindus of Kurg suffered a particularly brutal onslaught. Murders, tortures, forced conversions, even dead Hindus were converted, even dead Hindus. He destroyed 800 temples, 27 churches, captured 60,000 Christians, converted 30,000, killed thousands. And yet, and yet we call him a symbol of communal harmony. We cheer when the statue of the evil racist King Leopold is demolished in Belgium. But the same we, we celebrate Tipu Jayanti because tyrants who murder Hindus and Christians are not tyrant but heroes. Let me make a more contemporary example, our first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. He cultivated this image very carefully of an upholder, a protector of liberty and freedom of speech, an image that is still peddled by his worship, worshippers and historians and namesakes. But the reality is very different. Nehru was a tyrant, 
a ruthless oppressor of freedom. Did you know that under him the draconian First Amendment was brought in? That Majru was jailed for one year? That Stanley Wupert's book Nine Hours to Rama was banned? Did you know Chandra Mohini was banned? Audrey Menem's Ramayana was banned? Campbell's Heart of India was banned? Coastless Lotus and the Robot were banned? Freshler's Aisha was banned? Burton Russell's Unarmed Victory was banned? Just 30 more seconds. Robson's Five, film Nine Hours to Rama was banned. Robert Taylor's Dark Urge was banned. Binal Singh's Neela Akshar Niche was banned. Tony Hagan's Nepal was banned. Film Gokul Shankar was banned. Godse's Testimony was banned. Goswami's film Rumi was banned. Historian Dharampal was jailed. President Rajendra Prasad's speech was banned. Draconian Press Objectionable Act was passed. Magazine Cross Laws was banned. Play Communist Taki was banned. Its actors arrested. People's Theatre Association was banned. Play Harpita Master was banned. Film Ganga Jamna was blocked. Balraj Sani's play Jadu Ki Kursi was banned. Tagore's play Bisarjan was banned. Editor Pralad Atre was jailed, harmonium was banned, but hey, Nehru was liberal and protected freedom of speech and expression. To end then, history for us is either to be hidden or invented. We tell and retell what we like of it and what we don't. We scrunch it up and slip it under the mattress as if it doesn't exist. For the victors, a quill to write history with. For the vanquished, the burden to peddle it. But we forget. We forget that history is not homeopathy. It does not work as a placebo when diluted. It simply disappears. Ladies and gentlemen, we owe it to our survival to be ruthlessly honest about our history. We owe it to science to make sure history doesn't disappear. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Anand. How did you get that entire list programmed into your hard disk? Makes me wonder, you know. Well done, you know. Man has a strong memory. And just a small comment, you know, I think being a man of molecular medicine, you would agree that human beings have been on the planet for 120,000 years, and yet we only have 7,000 years of recorded history. So makes you wonder where this debate would have gone in that 113,000 years before history was ever written. Well done. We are adequately stirred. Now, in this perfect darkness, can I have the first? We'll take two questions because you see the e. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> questions will come after Sanjay. I beg to be corrected. Yeah, Sanjay, please fire away. And interjectors, please get ready. Interjectors, please get ready. Well, uh, Kunal, I hope you're not too right leaning. Huh? That worries me. No, you... no. I'm... <laughs> okay, good evening, Kolkata. Kolkata, you can do better than that. Good evening, Kolkata. Well, you know, I just thought after a laundry list of acquisitions made against Pandit Nehru, the one that Anand forgot to mention was that Jawaharlal Nehru was also responsible for the Ukraine war. He also forgot to mention about the Lakhimpur Kheri killings. He also forgot to mention about the high oil prices. It's a laundry list. I will stop it at that. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a very famous saying that George Orwell is credited for. George Orwell who wrote that chilling reality of probably even our modern times called 1984. Guess what George Orwell said? He said, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Think about it. A few years ago, I happened to be in Germany. Around 30 kilometers away from Munich, where I was very lucky to actually see Messi and, and uh, actually Neymar in the same hotel where I was staying in. Since you are Kolkata, I need to mention that I was lucky to see the uh, Barcelona team with Bayern Munich. The truth is I went down to see a place called Dachau. Dachau is the place where Adolf Hitler started one of his first few concentration camps. Nineteen thirty-three. By the time the war ended, ladies and gentlemen, forty one thousand people were dead. They were not political prisoners, they were intellectuals, they were writers, authors. Let me tell you the truth. 
The truth is that Dachau was an experiment which showed how when humanity goes insane, berserk, what it can do to itself. Why do I mention Dachau? Because the truth, ladies and gentlemen, is this. That Germany, despite the ignominy of having Adolf Hitler, exterminating six million Jews, continues to maintain that relic. If you walk through Dachau or Auschwitz, you see people from Australia, Japan, America, France, Sri Lanka, India, walk in silence. It's almost like a homage. But you can't run away from your past. And that is a way by which the Germans exercise their redemption, their atonement for a crime that probably the world will never forget. Why do I say this today? Enough has been said from both sides. I believe this debate is bipartisan. Because the truth, ladies and gentlemen, is we in India don't deserve to even debate on this topic. We actually insult our history. I hang my head in shame for what happened in 1984 during the Sikh riots. I live in Mumbai and I saw the destruction of my cosmopolitan city of Mumbai after the Babri Masjid demolition led to innocent people dying. I know and you know what happened in Gujarat after the Godra carnage. We know what happened in Muzaffar Nagar in 2013. And we know what happened when Donald Trump was visiting India and Delhi riots happened in 2020. Do we, do we have memorials to remember those who died? Innocent victims who had no fault of their own? Because we run away from our history, ladies and gentlemen. All of us do that. We are, this is a collective shame. And yet, there are nations that don't run away from it. You know the reason why I mention this? Because the whole debate is based on the premise that we are not willing to face our history. My colleagues have made some outstanding factual observations, and I've heard some from the other side. Basically, the other side is saying that there has been an attempt to romanticizing a certain era of Indian history, that we are looking at it from the prism of Mughal Azam, of poetry, of Sufi music, of culture, of architecture, of history. It is a topic of discussion. It can be interpreted both ways. Maybe one side began to look at a side that possibly they believed contributed to the largest syncretic culture in which all of us coexist today. Maybe the other side wants to remind us of the horrors of the past because they believe that can rekindle a very different element of conversation. But the truth is that you can change the name of a railway station. You can remove Aurangzeb Road. Yes, it's true that temples were plundered. It's true. I'm not going to run away from that. Yes, it's true that women and children were murdered. Yes, it's true that there was rampant destruction that happened by some of the emperors for sure. Maybe in part by all of them. But the truth also is that there was a, the other side to that conversation that you cannot ignore just because you choose to not confront history. And that history tells us this. That the Prime Minister, no matter what happens of India, speaks from the Red Fort. And the Taj Mahal still draws the highest tourist footfalls in our country. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a binary of the polarization that I'm seeing here. We may be polarized, but we don't have to hate each other. There are two different strands of thought. I worry about an India today for only one reason. The father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi today, is being questioned. And there are people in this country who want to celebrate Nathuram Godse as a patriot. To me, that is the conscience, ladies and gentlemen, that you will need to debate on and ask yourself when you vote at the end of this motion. And let me end, therefore, by just quoting to you a man called Rahat Indori, who famously said, Sabhi ka khun hai shamil yaha ki mitti mein. Sabhi ka khun hai shamil yaha ki mitti mein. Kisi ke baap ka Hindustan thodi hai. Thank you. Well said, well said, Sanjay.
and it was not just Bayern Munich and Barcelona in uh, you know uh, in, in, in what you saw, but Munich. I think, if memory is right, that 1933, Adolf Hitler's base as he wins two successive democratic elections. So uh, Anton Drexler and Adolf Hitler, they were based in Munich, and that was the cradle of the Nazi Party of that era. So ladies and gentlemen, we've completed the first round of speaking. And if there was ever an evening of intellectual vertigo, I think it is this one. Because every seven to eight minutes, we have swayed from one side to the other. And where are our interjectors? Can we have the first question? Interjectors, please. We are a little bit behind time. Are they here, Hassan? Hello. Could you come up, please? Because just come up, just come up. Because the audience is in relative darkness from the podium. Okay. okay. You're fine over there. You're fine over there. Young man, just identify yourself. Yes, I am Xavier Abhishek Rosario. I'm from CSC Department, uh, St. Xavier's College. A, li so, a little slow and the mic nearer to you. Okay, okay. So, who is the question for? It's for the proposition and it's for uh, Desh Ratan Nigam, sir. Right. Sir Re Desh Ratan Nigam. Quick. So, my question is that even after, re re even after re narrating the history, what good it will do to the present? The history is already an irreversible chemical reaction. And also, it will take more resource and energy and more time to re narrate the history. And if we even re narrate the history, then the secularism, like what will happen to the secularism of India? Like what guarantees that we, we are creating? We've got your question. Yes. We've got your question. Thank you. Just wait for your answer. Mr. Nigam, please ask you. Yeah, thank you. First, let me make it very clear. None of our co-panelists talked of Hindu history. We talked of Bharti Itihas, Indian history. That binary was brought about by the other side. Now, secondly, as I said in my opening statement, that I met history in the exalted corridors of this beautiful and august college. And she said, I don't want to be repeated. And please record it correctly. It was the pain. It is my fundamental right, please remember under Article 19, 1A, to know my past. And unless you know your past, you are willing to repeat the very same mistakes that has happened in the past and our lifespan is not too long to commit the entire set of mistakes again and to learn from it. And therefore, you require to learn from your mistakes, whether it is the history of riots, whether it is the history of religions, you have to know to what mistakes have been committed. History has to be a record of good, bad and ugly. Thank you, thank you. I Remember that. that. But what is to be your heritage, you have to choose that. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosario. Plus, yes. do, do remember, finish your exams quickly. Otherwise, you'll have a whole lot of new textbooks to read. Uh, you know? thank you, so sir. we'll take the next one. Because in these days, one more. Uttri, I'll give you a chance. I'll take one more young interjector. Where are you? Yes. Is there another student interjector there? Is there? Good evening, everybody. Hello, sir. Please identify yourself. Sir, my name is Aditi Ganeriwala. I'm from St. Xavier's College. Aditi, please hold the mic a bit closer. So, yeah, it's fine? A bit slower, yes. Okay. Louder and a bit slower. Okay, so because we are all old people, you see. <laughs> With the exception of Sanjeev, yes. <laughs> So yeah. my question is for uh, Manish Tiwari, sir. So do you really think that uh, the history is still written like as a male preserve in terms of authorship and like, uh, so it's still mainly written about men or by men? And if it is so, like, don't you think that it should be re-narrated? Hello, sir, am I audible? Yes. Quick, quick. So do you really think that history is still written as a male preserve in terms of authorship 
and it's still mainly written about men and by men. So don't you think that it should be narrated? First of all, thank you very much for that excellent question. The real question that we should be asking ourselves is that why do we want to re-narrate our history? Do we want to re-narrate our history because there are certain facts which have been missed out? Do we want to re-narrate our history because we feel that our entire historical paradigm has been written through a particular prism? Or do we want to re-narrate our history in order to suit the political predilections of the day. As my esteemed colleague Sanjay Jha very rightly pointed out when he referred to George Orwell, the people who want to re-narrate the history, they are not concerned about the past. They are concerned about actually shaping a future which is bigoted through the re-narration of that history. And that my dear young friend, is the real cause of worry, for the intent is malified, for the intent is vicious, for the intent is a poison chalice. And that's why we people on this side oppose the project of trying to re-narrate Indian history with a jaundiced eye. Uh, Th please, thank you, please, thank you. Please, thank just you. just let sir. me interject here. Yeah. I very proudly admit to what Manish has accused me of, I do want this poison chalice to be at least, you know, a little of the poison drawn out because I say this again with absolute certainty and pride. I don't care what use, word you use, re-narrate, add to the narration, change it, blah, blah. Women in Indian history need to be given their space and we haven't. And yes, I am worried about the future of this country. 48% was the data earlier. Today, it's a little over 50%. Young women in this country must know that their contribution, regardless. I said again, and I reiterate this. Well this is not politics. Thanks, thanks, ma'am. I don't care. Yeah. Women Sarkar, must be given yeah. their space in history. I think just, yeah. Uh, May I just uh, very quickly interject? Uh, I never made an accusation at Mrs. Kumar Mangalam. Now, if she wants to imagine an accusation and rebut it. That is like raising a ghost and slaying it and calling yourself superwoman. You can be my guest. <laughs> there, well ladies said. and gentlemen, think, is an example of this, this will be the last question for this round, please. We have to go to the summing up round quickly. Right, sure, thanks. I'm yeah. Parikshit Roy Chaudhary. I was a student of St. Xavier's School. My question is actually to Mr. Sanyal, and I'm glad that Mr. Tiwari was speaking about intent. Given that at least in today's schools and colleges, it is governments that are actually deciding what kind of history we re-narrate or speak of. How do you ensure that even if we do re-narrate our history, we do ensure that it's not only a political propaganda that's being, in, that's being propagated yeah, yeah. by the governments? I think and your ensure. point is made. Your point Thank is you. made. Sanjeev. At no point in time have we said that the re-narration should be not based on fact. We totally believe that the re-narration should be done based on well-researched primary evidence. The question is whether it should be re-narrated or not. After all, the best argument that our esteemed opposition has made is that our lies are better than their lies. That is no argument at all. The fact is that you need to present all the facts. After that, it is perfectly all right to provide different views. After all, remember, we can't even decide what happened yesterday. Watch any television debate. So it is not surprising that historians have difference of opinion of what happened 2,000 years ago. So the differences of opinion is not the problem. The problem is that a certain type of narrative, first colonial, overlaid by Nehruvian, and then Marxist, has been essentially now embedded and hardwired into the narrative that is particularly there in our textbooks. All we are arguing is that that narrative is false and needs to be re-narrated. At no point in time were we talking about all this Hindu, Muslim, and other things that the opposition accused of were not something that we made and, and were pushing for. It is their insinuation. Point taken, point taken, Sanjeev. 
Guru, just a minute. Yeah. Uh, I need to make one short point to what Mr. Sure. Sanyal said. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sanyal used the word facts and evidence. And I think what should concern us all is in certain school textbooks, they are saying that Nathuram Godse never killed Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi ji actually committed suicide. Now, these are the facts that are actually, I would like to say, the opinion is your own, but the facts are facts, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I think, uh, do we have a last question? No, one more. Just the last yes, question, yeah, please, quick. Young man, be quick. Sir, I'm Obinandan Bhak from yes. St. Xavier's College. My yes, Obinandan. It's for Sanjay Jha, sir. So we came to know today that eminent personalities like Alexander and Ashoka were out of our syllabus, history syllabus, for a, like... Just come to your question. We, we, we yeah. heard them. We, we heard them. Uh, isn't it, doesn't it make sense to re-narrate our history to find out more such personalities who have been lost throughout the year of history? Well, well, let me tell you, let me tell you, remember, this is a young country, okay? We are a young country. And the very fact that all of us are sitting here, and this has been an outstanding panel discussion so far, is a manifestation that a lot of things that we have done has been right. But I will agree with you that education, society, uh, development, infrastructure, health, everything is an evolving process. If the right, if this opposite side were to improve and add and give more content to the learning, it's great. The risk that we are running is distortion. The risk that we are running is that it is being recalibrated. The risk that we are running is that it is being given a very different flavor. And that makes the entire society come at a very critical juncture of misinformation. I would rather say at this point that I accuse my channel or my partners on the right hand side of fake news, distortion, post-truth, alternative facts. Fake news had to come in somewhere. Thank you. With that, you know, there could be many more interjector interjections, but we have to move on. And as we move on, I think I, I, I plead with the speakers to make the best use of the three minutes, strictly three minutes at your disposal. Give us either your synopsis or rebuttal or a supplement. And to lead the, to start off the speeches in the synopsis round, the rebuttal round, we start in the reverse order. We start with the members of the opposition first. Mr. Manishankar Ayer, please. Nothing I heard so far warrants my having to come again. For it does not matter whether Sir Sayyid talked of the two nation theory or not. What matters is that the guru of the present dispensation, who is also the guru of all those on the other side, what did he say? And that is damning. We also heard a great litany from that chemistry professor or microbiology, uh, certainly not a historian. I mistook him to be a historian. Uh, I'm sorry for that. But you came in here with a litany of complaints. Now, what's the point of a litany of complaints when equally, if you had balanced yourself with all that we have achieved, Amir Khosro, you have nothing to say about him? You have nothing to say about the Taj Mahal. You have nothing to say about the syncretic nature of Indian history and culture, not at the end of the day with regard to the Muslims, but with regard to all that happened before the Prophet Muhammad even arrived on earth. We have demonstrated that our civilizational genius is the absorption and synthesizing of all influences from outside. And it led to Mahatma Gandhi, who unfortunately is not here among us, but I'm sure would be on our side of this debate, saying that I do not want the windows and doors of my house to be stuffed. I want the winds from everywhere to blow around, but I refuse to be knocked off my feet. And therefore, I refuse to be knocked off my feet by Dr. Ranganathan's uh, litany of complaints. They want to avenge themselves on history. That is the truth. They want to get their own back 
on Mohammed bin Qasim and Aurangzeb and others. But we need to also rec re recognize, as my friend Manish Tiwari tried to do, that there were, ever since or uh, Akbar certainly, there was not a Hindu-Muslim divide in our country. There were many, many Muslims who served Maratha kings and Rajput kings, and there were many Hindus who served the, uh, in the civil service and in the military, the Mughal kings and the other Muslim kings. Ours is a nation of synthesis, and that is that story which is told in the regular history of India as written by Indians. And what is sought to be done is to make this litany of grievances into the basis of writing history. I think it'll be okay for you to go to your psychiatrist with that litany of grievances, but to make it the basis of your position in this debate is I think to abuse the nature of this debate, which was to see whether there is anything that warrants the re-narration of the total act, totality of our history. I'm saying you, you can certainly you. revise what you want in scholarly terms and for scholastic purposes, but to do it for a political purpose is illegitimate and therefore not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ayer. Sanjeev, do you have a hidden agenda in all this re-narration business? I'm glad the opposition agrees entirely with us that the history needs to be rewritten and re-narrated. Because Mr. Jha came and told us that we don't even need to deserve to debate this topic. Well, sir, why are you here in that case? <laughs> their best argument is that our lives are better than their lives. Mr. Manish Rivari narrated a long list of things which he thinks are important. But the fact is, did any of you know all of those facts? No. I totally agree they should be added to the narrative. That is the precise point I'm making. And as far as Godse is concerned, I'm completely unaware of any textbook anywhere in the country where he has been said that he didn't assassinate Gandhi. That's just a complete straw man. But do those regular textbooks mention that after that assassination, there were widespread riots all across the country where Maharashtrians, particularly Maharashtrian Brahmins, were targeted. Hundreds, perhaps thousands were killed. Tens of thousands of houses were burned down. If that history had been written and told to you, perhaps 1984's anti-Sikh riots would not have happened. Since you are interested in Savarkar so much, please mention Savarkar quote him, we have no problem. The problem is that, along with that, you also need to mention that Savarkar set up the Avinav Bharat movement in London and across Europe, that he created an amazing revolutionary network that went on not only to assassinate Curzon Wiley, but also in North America, it led to the Gadarite revolt. Mention also how he was sent to Kalapani, where he spent 14 years being tortured, fully documented and very well documented, and then another 14 years being in house arrest. Since you are interested in retelling all this history, or rather not retelling this history, what are you trying to say? You are basically saying that the existing set cannot be in any way tampered with even if new evidence appears. After all, history, like any other field, is an evolving field. New texts are found. New archaeology is found. Genetics is, comes about. All of this means that history needs to be continually refreshed like any other body of knowledge. And yet, we are told that any tampering with this Nehruvian Marxist story would somehow bring down the house. Why? All we are saying from our side is that history needs to be re-narrated because it is an evolving field that all of us need to understand in order to understand ourselves 
that requires us to take on board many of the things the other side has also said. After all, to say that we talk about history and try want to somehow talk only about the pain, well, it is possible to appreciate cricket, the beauty of the English language, or even have an English breakfast, but at the same time not appreciate the brutality of British colonial rule. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Sanjeev. You know, with that many variations, I think history will end up looking like the coronavirus, you know, because very shortly we are going to have history alpha, beta, theta, delta, gamma, and uh, I don't know who will be entrusted with the job of the anti history vaccinations. But on that note, we are all ears for Mr. Tiwari to give us his rebuttals and synopsis for his three minutes. Please, sir. Mr. Chairperson, I've been uh, the information minister of this country. But today, I truly saw the soul of jo <coughs> Joseph Goebbels come alive in the other side. Goebbels had famously remarked that if you repeat a lie a thousand times, it becomes the truth. But unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, it still does not become the truth. Because how much ever you may try to obfuscate the truth, truth does not die. And the reason why these gentlemen on the other side want to re-narrate history is primar primarily goes into the genesis of the Indian Republic. Out of the ravages of partition emerge three things. A Muslim Pakistan and two competing visions of India. A theocratic vision which believed that because we have a religious partition or had a religious partition, India should have been a Hindu rush. And another vision which believed that notwithstanding a religious partition, India should be a liberal, inclusive nation. It should be the umbrella under which everybody, or the rainbow under which everybody can, can thrive. That vision held the field from 1947 to 2014. And it was upended, upended on the promise of Ache Din. And those Ache Din, unfortunately, we've not seen for the last nine years. But what we've seen is a bigoted attempt to open the quarrel with history and try and rewrite it through the myopic lens of what they have been brought up to believe in. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my fundamental problem with this motion, that their intent is absolutely malafide. And I was amazed at the lies which have been uttered in order to try and airbrush the role of Mr. Sarbarkar. Let me just quote what he said in his presidential address to the Akhil Bharti Hindu Mahasabha at its 19th session in Ahmedabad. As it is, there are two antagonistic nations living side by side in India, and several infantile politicians commit the serious mistake in supposing that India is already welded into a harmonious nation. As time is running short, I will end the, the, this quote by again quoting him, let us bravely face unpleasant facts as they are. India cannot be assumed today to be a Unitarian and a homogeneous nation. But on the contrary, there are two nations in the main, the Hindus and the Muslims of India. And that is the pedigree that they come from. And what differentiates us from them is that they believe in a bigoted India and we believe in an inclusive India. And that is why we do not want the history of India to be narrated through a particular lens. Thank you very much. Mr. Nigam, Mr. Tiwari has pointed the gun absolutely sharp. It's your turn to rebut. Well, Chairman, sir, the gun was pointed, but it didn't have any bullet in it. 
before, you know, when I came here, I thought everybody was ignited minds on this stage. At the end of the debate, I see something burning on the other side. And let me tell you, uh, well, it was talked about two-nation theory. I'm not saying in, in, in 1947, when 98.5% of the people who voted for creation of Pakistan stayed back in India, should it not be debated whether two-nation theory went away or it is still subsisting, although I agree huge amount of Muslims have given it up. Now, secondly, when people on the other side call India a young country, then the first son of India becomes the father of the nation. And the son becomes older than the father. That's the huge, you know, dichotomy that they have. You call him father, but you still say our nation is 7,000 years old. Now, they all agree that 1857 was the first war of independence. It was solely due to Veer Savarkar, but you will accept that proposition, but reject Veer Savarkar. So that's the dichotomy they suffer from. And therefore, what needs to be told, you have to record if anything has been done or said wrongly by Veer Savarkar, but you can't wipe him out out of the history books. It has to be debated, investigated, recorded, good, bad, or ugly. And logical deductions and conclusions have to be drawn based on archaeological and scientific evidence, not the opinions which have been paraded and dished out to us till now. Now, let me give, give you a few more examples since I have some seconds. We all have been told that the judicial system we inherited from the British, but forget that the Smritis gave us the system of justice. Even we have the concept of division benches of more than one judge is listing a case. This is given in our Smritis. Verbatim copied by the other side. Then let me also, they talk of punishment of judges and let me tell you, Manu Smriti, yes, if Manu Smriti, Smriti has said something bad, it must be recorded. I'm not saying. It has to be debated. That's our uh, tradition. Now Manu Smriti says, judges who fail to remove injustice and is also a mute spectator are to be destroyed because they are the last bastion of justice and if they are part of it, then they have to be destroyed. Please remember the word used is destroyed, a very strong word. Now, constitution of courts, exactly given in our scriptures, which we follow today, but we were told it has come from the outside. And let me tell you, the concept of mediation in which was utilized in the Ram Mandir case, they said, we've got it from US. Has anybody forgotten Lord Krishna, Bhagwan Shri Krishna? He tried mediation to the best to avoid the Mahabharat, the war. And when everything failed, then the war took place. He was the first mediator in the entire history, ancient, past, and present, to have utilized the alternative dis dispute resolution. Mr. Nigam, thank you. That, that has been wiped out. So record good, bad, and ugly. But what should be a part of your heritage, you have to be very careful about. Mr. Nigam, thank you again. It was so comforting to know that the ancient scriptures, uh, you know, uh, talked about punishing the judges because a lot of ancient scriptures, including the one in the court of Hammurabi in Assyrian civilization, talks about punishing doctors. So I think, you know, your, your, your judicial system gives us very good company. On that note, we come to Johorda. Mr. Johor Sharkar to, for his round of rebuttal. Johorda, please. They said <clears throat> that we have never spoken about religion. You are the one who's bringing religion and party and others into it. Manuspriti, I believe, is part of our religion, the tolerant part notwithstanding. Now, you have mentioned Savarkar, Savarkar, Savarkar. But can you come up with the whole truth of Savarkar? Savarkar is the only person who was among the thousands who were jailed in the cellular, in, in Andamans, the only person to go to the British 
and ask for forgiveness not once but thrice. Try to strike a deal with them while other patriots rotted and died and were hung in the Andamans. The only one and he is your spiritual guru. Savarkar is the only one <coughs> who opposed the national freedom struggle of 1942. Will you be able to stomach it and come out in public and re-narrate? No, you won't. That the RSS to which one of you belong, at least overtly, RSS opposed the freedom struggle, opposed the tricolor flag in writing, opposed the constitution in writing, and had to be jailed for 18 months for them to agree to come with the mainstream of the Indian constitution. This is your accursed history. This is your, somebody talked of molecular medicine acting as an antidote. I think he needs to take it first. He needs to take it first because he is the only one who has made a sick statement that Nehru was a tyrant just because he banned a few books. He is no way compared to the man who rules India. 12,000 people are in jail. 12,000 people are in jail under UAPA without trial. The rate of prosecution, rate of conviction is 2%. Sometimes goes up to 3%. 12,000 people are in jail. 15 old men and women are dragged and kept in jail and one of them has been killed. That is your sense. You want to ask about re-narration, re-interpretation? Bhai sahab, I'll tell you. We just don't trust you. We just don't trust you. History is a continuous addition, we admit, but we don't trust you. You talk of riots. Do you, can you come up with the Gujarat riot? Where 1,000 Muslims and 300 Hindus were killed? Can you come up with the truth? How the state looked the other way around? You talk of liberation, civilization means destroying Gyan Vapi Mosque. You talk of invaders. Who were the Ahoms? The patriotic Ahoms? They came in from Southeast Asia. They came in and invaded, I'm using the word invaded, and then became patriotic Hindus after 350 years of staying away from the mainstream. So the bottom line is, an invader who has come in and become Hindu is a patriot, is a Hindu. The one who chose to believe in some other religion is an anti-national. No, sir, we do not accept that history, not that interpretation. Do not destroy the country into which you were born, I was born. I oppose the motion. Thank you. I think on that note, the work is cut out for Anand. Oh, thank you. I said, I think Lalita will go after you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry, sorry. It's my name. Lalita, please go. Sure, sure. No, my mistake. You see, my friends, my point has been made. I was overlooked even on this stage. <laughs> Sorry again. Very bad, doctor. <laughs> now, the topic today evening seems to have been sufficiently politicized by my male uh, compatriots on both sides of the table. I refuse to do that. I just want to ask a few questions of everybody, not just, and they're not my rivals. Most of them I've known for donkey's years especially because most of my family is in the Congress, even now there are. So it's not that we are rivals or we're fighting over it. You know, Darwin used to say that if humankind has to survive, we have to be adaptable to change. My demand is not I'm asking, I'm not asking you to re-narrate history by obliviating everything that's already written. I'm saying that there are gaps in the history that we've been taught. I'm sure all of you agree, there are gaps. Everybody who writes is as human as you or me. They've made mistakes. There are two sides to every big leader we've, laid, uh, we've heard about. Whether it is Nehru, whether it is uh, Savarkar, if you want to call him a leader, whether it is anybody. You have Nehru. Then why haven't we given that sort of importance to Shubhash Chandra Bose? I'm a Bengali, half Bengali. My blood is very hot here huh, when it comes to this. So all I'm asking is that those who've been left out, who have made a contribution, 
maybe in the inadvertently, I am not making accusations, and I say this, I don't like this habit of making personal remarks about people whom I'm having a debate with. That's not a debate, that's politics. And I'm not here to play politics. So I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, if I'm not giving you those witty tidbits that the others have given, but I still feel very strongly that if you talk about the Taj Mahal, it's beautiful. For me, it's just one white mausoleum. Why don't you talk about my Brahadeshwara temple, which was built thousands of years before Taj Mahal and is an exquisite piece of both scientific building and sculptures? Why is it that history has not been written equally? And perhaps, I'm not saying it's been done deliberately. I'm not saying it's been done because of politics. I'm just saying that from what I can see, it has not been equal to all sides. Like I said, I'm half South Indian, half Bengali. Where is my Bengal? So much of Bengal is missing. Our art, our culture, our, 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 our food. I mean, just us. The same about Tamil Nadu and my grandmother was from Mangalore. So where are we in the history books? Shouldn't we be there? You don't want to say it, re narrate Don't use that word. Add. Build to it. Give a more complete picture. Give us a choice. Manish Tiwari said, and so did uh, Manishankaraya, that ours is a synthesis. Well, in syncretic India, why leave out parts, even if it is not deliberate? And all I'm suggesting now is that, trust me or not, like I said, I don't give a damn. I want facts means facts from all sides. Leave the politics aside. Who's here now? Who rules now? Who ruled 100 years ago? Which family? Which individual? What their politics is? Hindus versus Muslims? All this, I don't care. Razia Sultan was anyway not a Hindu woman, she was Muslim. To me, it's all equal. I want to have a history that more fairly and more equally represents all of India. And that, I think, is a fair enough reason for me to say that, yes, Indian history should perhaps not be rewritten. I think that's the wrong word that was chosen. But Indian history needs a lot of additions to it to make it a better basis for us to build a better country on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we have the last word that comes in from the opposition, Mr. Sanjay Jha. Uh, Lalita, you were complaining that you overlooked. Kunal actually completely forgot me, so you're still better <laughs> off than I was. Okay? <laughs> And by the way, it's very, it's very nice of you to make this passionate, rhetorical you know, speech about Netaji Bose because you know that he was a legend and it will have an emotional connect with the audience. But I will complete the story for you. Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose had contempt, he despised and he hated people with a communal mindset. Let's put that on record today, Kolkata. That this is the greatness of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. And we need to kind of rise up for him beyond our little petty parochial considerations. The very important point, my friend Sanjeev, I have great respect for him. Uh, I don't agree with his economics maybe, but you know, he said that I said that the house doesn't deserve to debate this topic. You know why? That was a sardonic dig at this team because my objection with the panel on the right side is the fact that they don't want to improve history. They want to distort it. And there's a big difference between the two. It's like when you have a puncture, when you have a flat tire, you want to fix the tire. They want to remove the wheels. I'm sorry, that's not the way history works. We have a responsibility towards the young of India. We have a responsibility towards an impressionable India that is being ruined by negative propaganda, distorted misinformation, and the worst thing that can happen is if you begin to influence them by giving them extremely, what I call as, Malafide education at the elementary school level. We should worry about that. The other point that Mr. Sanyal mentioned was that when I talked about the ridiculous, preposterous, atrocious, absurd, ludicrous, I can give you some more synonyms, ladies and gentlemen, that Gandhiji committed suicide, he said no. Well, I just said in my talk earlier that I accuse my team of fake news. It is there in the newspapers. You can Google it on your 
mobile phones right now. Did Gandhi ji commit suicide? It's a whole report, 13th or 14th of October 2019, covered by every mainstream media. I actually debated that on a TV channel, so I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so fake news, ladies and gentlemen, is not gonna happen here. The other point, and perhaps the best illustration of what I call is deception. They build the tallest statue of Sardar Patel. And you know what they say? Because Sardar Patel was having differences with Pandit Nehru. You know what? Can you imagine leaders like Netaji Bose, Maulana Azad, Sardar Patel, Netaji, uh, Pandit Nehru and Gandhiji not having differences in terms of how India should be liberated? Does that mean they hated each other? This is the worst malicious, malignant propaganda you can ever hear. So I want to tell you, Sardar Patel banned the RSS. What? Kunal, I'm done. Sardar Patel banned the RSS. You should read Sardar Patel's letters to Pandit Nehru. And he said, they distributed sweets when Gandhiji died. The truth, ladies and gentlemen, does not change. You can change the history, ladies and gentlemen. If you are in power, you can. But let me tell you, that does not change the reality. The truth always remains truth. Thank you very much. And your version of the truth, Anand. Mr. Chairperson, there are no versions of the truth. There is only truth. There is no Roshiman. Um, let me go one by one because there's quite a lot of material our opposing side has provided us. Sanjay is a very dear friend, but he reminded me of uh, Guido in Fellini's Eight and a Half, who said, I have nothing to say, but I'll say it anyway. I mean, <laughs> in fact, he agreed with our proposition. I'm, ashamed. I'm kind of embarrassed. And he talks of both. Sanjay, do you know who snooped on Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and his family for 30, 40 years? Do you know that it wasn't until 2019 that INA members were allowed to take part in Republic Day Parade? What are you talking about? Shouldn't these facts be known? And who? Who snooped? Yes, Jawaharlal Nehru. Of uh, the excellent Mani Shankar Iyer, his arguments are like expired poison you are left wondering whether it is more poisonous or less poisonous. I mean, he accuses me of narrating a litany of complaints about Nehru banning books and films. Well, he is a writer. He has written, albeit contentious, uh, a lot of books. How would he feel if Modi banned all his books? Would he not want people to know that Modi has banned his books? Would, would film writers not want to know that Nehru banned their books or their films? or jailed writers, jailed authors, jailed Matru, Majru Sultanpuri because he called Nehru as Hitler ka chela. And one of the other speakers, I'll come to him abhi, sabka hisab hai. He said, he talked about, uh, you know, Nehru ke liye complaint kar rahe ho, Nehru ko tyrant kar rahe ho, dekho, Modi kya kar, is that the argument? Two wrongs make a right? By the way, I also have a list where this present government has been stomping on freedom of speech and expression. I do. And I am the first one to shout from the uh, rostrum saying that uh, UAPA charges have been leveled. People have been arrested. But this gentleman did not talk about how in this West Bengal, Mamatadi has also arrested people on charges of sedition, on charges of UAPA. That he will not tell. But I'll come to that later. I'll come to my another good friend, Manish. You know, his arguments were excellent, except for the beginning, the middle, and the end. He quoted Churchill. Now, I am not one to quote the racist Churchill because it's not politically correct, but let me quote because he did. Incidentally, he was wrong on the number of Mengolis who died of famine. There were 4.3 million. He should know his facts, but then they are from the other side. But, you know, Churchill said, an empty taxi rolled into 10 Downing Street and Chamberlain got out. He reminded me of that. Now, let me come very finally. I have very few time left. I'm sure I'll get 30 more seconds off Mr. Jawar Sarkar. You know, he managed to pack in so many lies in seven minutes. It is entirely fitting that he's a member of parliament. I do not have time. In fact, I'm running out of time, but I beg for 30 more seconds because I need to expose just four of his lies. Number one, this 15, <laughs> 15 lakh thing about Modi is absolute fake news. Modi never said that he will transfer 15 lakhs into everyone's account. He never said it. This is fake news. Number two, I knew he wanted to draw on the, uh, on the audience 
and it was a very conceited ploy to mention church attacks. Does he know that that was the first fake narrative of 2014 that he later transpired that all those churches that were attacked were actually arson and looting and more churches had uh, had had the same fate under UPA than NDA? He did not say that. Number three. He talked of Buddhism. Does he know that Ashoka was Buddhist already for four years before he went into Kalinga, Kalinga war and killed millions? Does he know that? We don't know this. Nobody knew this except Sanjeev Sanyal's book when I read it. Number four, he talked about Savarkar not supporting Quit India. Sure. Does he know that Ambedkar said to Anna. support Quit India is insane. Gandhi is a prophet of dark age. And finally, you must allow me. I beg you. He talked of Manu Smriti. Sure, burn it, Mr. Sarkar. I'll be the first one, although I don't want burning. I don't like burning books, but burn Manuspriti. But I ask you, if you have the guts, you will answer. What do you want to do with a book that says, polytheists, i.e. Hindus are the worst of creatures, 98.6, that men have control over women and then can beat them, 434, that if you don't believe in our verses, you will rot in hell, that women are tilling fields. Go Thank unto you. them as Thank you like. You, what Thank do you want you. to do with that book? Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Hassan. Please take your seat. Your vote is needed as well. Pradeep, shall we go for a show of lights or a show of hands? The lights, I think we do have insufficient light for the audience. So, put your mobile lights to good use, ladies and gentlemen. For a good part of the almost last two hours, you have heard a brilliant speech after speech on this evening's motion that this house believes that it is necessary to re-narrate Indian history, our history. All of you who side with the opposition against the motion, those of you who side with the opposition and take a stance that no, it is not necessary to re-narrate our history, show your lights. Hold them up for a minute. I know you're tired. You've got an idea? Thank you. Please don't put them up again. Huh. I know you won't. And all those who have sided with the proposition in agreeing to the motion that there is a need to re-narrate our history, show your lights up. I think this show of lights throws light on the fact that it is perhaps the, of course, the faith of the house lies in the fact that it, 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 it is indeed necessary to re-narrate our history. So ladies and gentlemen, the motion is carried. Thank you again. You've been a wonderful audience. And we'll meet again for the next Father Joris Memorial Debate. Thank you all. Have a very good night. God bless.